Cattle Trails Tribal Trails Cumberland House is a northern community in Saskatchewan located 163 kilometers northeast of Nipawin. During the fur trade era, the community served as a main supply depot and transportation hub as waterways led southwest to the plains and north to the Church Hill River system where you could go east to Hudson Bay and west to the Athabasca regions. Nowadays, Cumberland House retains a small business core. Our guest, Carl Crane, came from Cumberland House. Hi, I'm Conrad Flett. Welcome to Travel Trails. Today, we'll visit with Carl and his wife, Kathy, in Prince Albert. Carl begins to share about his childhood in Cumberland House. I grew up in the uh, community of uh, Cumberland House. Not directly in uh, Cumberland House, Saskatchewan, but uh, about three miles out of uh, Cumberland House, right by the banks of uh, Saskatchewan River. Hmm. That's where I was raised. In right up to uh, when I was about 10 years old. And, and then from there, it's um, moving on back and forth from uh, the trap line and stuff like that. And spent a lot of time in the wilderness with my dad and uh, family. And um, when I turned uh, 14 years old, I uh, family moved to uh, the Paw Manitoba. And um, it was something that, um, the family had to decide. First it was my dad that went ahead and then my mom decided to move the, all the rest of the family because of, uh, of things that weren't uh, working out okay in, uh, in Cumberland. The system with the, uh, with the government wasn't working out for the, for the family because of uh, health issues with, uh, with alcohol. They come to that point where that uh, the government didn't want anything to do to help out in such a way, and um, and then there was a threat that uh, the kids would be taken away to a to a residential school. My mom gave us that option whether we wanted to stay, go to school, to a residential school, or else we move the family to another province where. We would uh, start a new life, like you know, especially for them anyway, in regards to uh, work and you know, the mill was going, and uh, my dad had the opportunity to work there. I tried going to school there too, but uh, a lot of things weren't working out okay because uh, a lot of things were happening that were uh, disturbing, you know, between the town and the and the reserve and. Uh, the things that were happening back home at that time when uh, things weren't uh, working for my parents because of their um, addictions and all those kind of came rushing in with uh, what was going on in Nepal and uh, it was uh, something that I wasn't prepared for. It was an experience that, um, that was really life-changing for me which uh, got me going in, um, in situations where I hung around with friends that, uh, that uh, got into uh, alcohol. And it got to a point where um, everything started uh, happening to me. Um, I started missing school and, and I finally dropped out. And what happened at, um, at that time was that uh, they put me back in a, a lower grade. I should have been at a grade 10 level, but then um, I, um, they dropped me back down to grade eight and then and I tried working my way back from there. And then uh, I wasn't very comfortable in class because I was the only <laughs> native kid in the, in the classroom and, uh, and things were happening. I didn't know anything about, like, you know, there was racism happening there, which I didn't know anything about. I didn't learn that in Cumberland. That was uh, very traumatic for me. And uh, that kind of triggered a lot of these things that um, for me to, to, start, uh, to start drinking again and trying to forget about what was going on. 
It is the one who spends long hours in the taverns, trying out new drinks. Don't gaze at the wine, seeing how red it is, how it sparkles in the cup, how smoothly it goes down. For in the end, it bites like a poisonous snake, it stings like a viper. I wasn't at home on weekends. My mom and dad probably were worried about me, and I know that they were. There were times that I had gone home and I uh, rebelled against uh, what was happening with me because of what I experienced when I was growing up in, um, where, uh, with my parents and uh, siblings, all the things that were happening in, uh, in the house. There was a lot of uh, fighting happening because of the uh, alcohol addiction. After I, uh, you know, uh, sobered up, you know, I did something. I knew that I did something wrong, and it really bothered me. When these things were happening, I, uh, I thought about uh, the times that uh, we spent in um, Sunday classes with um, uh, Joseph Poop and uh, Helen Poop while they were ministering there. They did a lot of um, uh, scripture reading for us, with us, and then uh, all the, um, the things that uh, they, they talked about, and, and the people that uh, that came there to help them out with the uh, ministering. And um, the things that they talked about were um, very blunt. You know, that uh, really scared me. And. Uh, in this, especially when they started talking about uh, heaven and hell. And uh, it really struck me. And uh, that stayed in the back of my head right from the time I was 10 years old, maybe younger. What does the Bible say about heaven and hell? The book of Revelation recorded a vision in which the Apostle John saw a new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God. He also heard a voice saying from the throne, Look, God's home is now among his people. He will live with them and they will be his people. God himself will be with them. He will wipe every tear from their eyes and there will be no more death or sorrow or crying or pain. All these things are gone forever. In short, heaven is God's home, a place of life, comfort, and peace. It is a place where we should choose to go. Heaven becomes our home when Jesus Christ is the Lord and Savior of our lives. In Mark chapter 9, Jesus described another place called hell, where the maggots never die. And the fire never goes out. That's the lake of fire described in the book of Revelation. A place where you wouldn't want to go. Also, the Bible says, And anyone whose name was not found recorded in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. If your name is not registered in the book of life, I encourage you to do it today. If you need further assistance, Call us. Something happened in 1974 that uh, really changed my life around. That, uh, I lost uh, two brothers and uh, one cousin and two, uh, two other friends at the same night. That really traumatized me. And, and I, I, you know, you think that I would uh, quit drinking at that time. But uh, I just kept drinking uh, just to try and drown, drown the sorrows that I was going through, the hurt that I was going through, the bitterness that I, I was going through towards that man that did that. And then I was, I was angry at God too when that happened. I asked, why, did, why was this happening? I even went and talked to uh, a minister that was stationed there at that time. And I uh, kind of re rebelled 
about what happened towards them. I was so angry. I didn't know what I was saying at that time, but, uh, but when I showed up, it dawned to me that uh, it was wrong what I did. I regretted what I said. Each night I went to bed, I was thinking this was all just a nightmare. I wanted to wake up uh, to see my brothers again, my, my friends. But the reality was that they were gone. And it was pretty hard. I just kept on drinking. It got to a point where um, I ended up in the hospital a few times because of a nervous breakdown. A, um, a friend of uh, my sister's took me to the hospital and then uh, I ended up staying in there for uh, the whole night. And the doctor finally told me after the third time I was in there that I should um, quit what I was doing. That um, before it's too late because this was going to uh, come to a point where you you're going to end up somewhere that you won't like. So I thought about that. It stuck to my head that I needed to do something to, about my life. And then from there, I, I thought about starting to, trying to look for a job, start my life right back around, you know. It's right from, from scratch. I decided to, uh, to travel and I told my mom and dad that I needed to go somewhere. I got my first job in uh, Fort Nelson, BC. That was the very first time out away from my uh, family, especially my parents, and my siblings. It was pretty lonesome at times because I, uh, I felt like I was uh, going alone, not realizing what the Lord was doing for me was uh, He was taking me on, on a long journey, on a journey to find what I was looking for. King Solomon said, I have seen the burden God has placed on us all. Yet God has made everything beautiful for its own time. He has planted eternity in the human heart. But even so, people cannot see the whole scope of God's work from beginning to end. I ran into people that uh, were very nice people. And uh, I stayed with them for three, four years, and then I moved on from there. I decided to come back, back around to uh, Manitoba. From BC, I would go back home to visit my parents. And then on my way back and forth, in between there, and um, there was a school there, a KBI school. My friends were going to school there. I used to, my sister used to stop in on them, and I would, um, and I knew that they were there, and, and I was, I was happy to see them. And I was happy for them that they decided to uh, get to know the the Bible in that school, and know the Lord. On my second time there, I think I I received the Bible by one of them, and uh, I kept reading that Bible. The teaching of your word gives light, so even the simple can understand. As I was traveling, I ended back up in the pond, and I ended back up in the, in the trap line with one of my uh, young brothers. But I had kept uh, that Bible with me. I kept reading that Bible. And uh, I knew there was something happening to me. That's where I started thinking about uh, changing, completely changing my life around. I needed to do something with my life. Because um, along those, those times that I was traveling, I thought to myself, you know, if I was strong enough and had the willpower to quit drinking and smoking, I can do anything on my own. I was so wrong about that. 
This is what the Lord says. Cursed are those who put their trust in mere humans, who rely on human strength and turn their hearts away from the Lord. The worst part of it is uh, all those, um, the bitterness and the, and the anger that stayed with me kept popping in my, in, a, in my head. I read uh, in the book about uh, forgiveness. And um, that's when I uh, decided to uh, forgive that, that man that took my, uh, my brothers and friends along with my cousin. I needed to forgive that man that did that. It was the hardest thing that I ever done. And that's when everything started lifting from me. Everything started to change and I wanted to be more and more focused on getting to know the Lord. During my travels from, um, from British Columbia to um, the Palm, back and forth, on my last trip back to Manitoba, that's when I uh, gave my life to the Lord. What should someone do after he puts his faith in Jesus Christ? The question reminds me of an interesting story in Acts chapter 8, starting from verse 26. The angel of the Lord told Philip to go down south to the desert road that ran from Jerusalem to Gaza, where he met the treasurer of Ethiopia. The man was a eunuch of great authority serving the queen of Ethiopia. He had gone to Jerusalem to worship and he was on his way home. Seated in his chariot, he was reading out loud from the book of the prophet Isaiah. The Holy Spirit told Philip to approach the man. Philip obeyed. As he ran over there, he heard the eunuch read Isaiah 53, 7 and 8. Philip asked him, Do you understand what you're reading? The man replied, How can I, unless someone instructs me? Then he invited Philip to come up into his chariot and sit with him. The eunuch asked Philip, Tell me, was the prophet talking about himself or someone else? Philip told him that the good news was about Jesus. As they traveled along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, Look, here is water. Why shouldn't I be baptized? That's exactly what our guest wanted to do. In the summer of 2020, Carl asked Gary Quickreese to baptize him at the Living Waters Camp. Before the baptism, Gary shared his thoughts on the faith of the Ethiopian eunuch. The thing that we see about this man is what is being uh, sort of uh, brought to us in this text. One of the things he had was he had a Bible in his hand. You know, the Word of God was in his hand. In order for us to make a confession of faith, we need to be touched by the Spirit of God through the Word of God. This man was reading Scripture. When Scripture, I wrote here, forms a theme of our thoughts and meditation, we are sure to become more acquainted with the author of the Word and uh, through the Holy Spirit. The other thing he had was, uh, he had a, a desire that was in his heart. In verse uh, 31 to 35, we read that he wanted so much to know uh, what the scripture was saying. And Philip was able to interpret the passage to him. You know, Philip told him, Jesus, Jesus is the key. We see not only a hand, a Bible in his hand, but we see uh, the, uh, the desire of his heart. 
And when we are lost in sin, we have no awareness of our uh, condition of sin until God begins to stir in us, in our heart. That's what happened to this eunuch. He also had a, a, a root here object in his eye in verse 37. You know, I wrote here the thought of object is uh, his attention was fixed on Christ and he was captivated by Christ. In verse 37 it says, Philip said, if thou believe in thine heart, with all thine heart, thou mayest. So the object of his of his eye. He was very much affected by what he was reading. The other thing is uh, in verse 37 he's asked if thou believe that Jesus, if thou believe with all thine heart thou mayest. He answered and said, he said I believe. I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Confession of his lips. This eunuch, after he got baptized, he went from that place with the joy of the Lord, rejoicing. He wanted to identify himself with Christ in baptism. He invited this man, a stranger, to ride with him in the chariot, a companion who knew the Lord. And this miracle took place in that place called Gaza. I believe it was a desert place. You know, it's an honor to be here with uh, my brother, Carl. And we're gonna baptize you, Carl, over there. And uh, out there in that open water, the, the minister will ask you, they'll ask you, Carl, do you believe that Jesus Christ is Son of God? And what do you say? Yes. Have you received Christ as your personal Lord and Savior? They'll say out there. What do you say? Upon a confession of your faith, we'll baptize you. Right? Them the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. According to Romans 6, in baptism, Carl identified himself with Christ in three areas, his death, burial, and resurrection. As a result, he is dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ. If you have further questions about salvation and Christian living, call us. Carl concludes today's program with this thought. I'm very happy to say that I, I know the Lord now. Mm -hmm. I know everything has changed. Everything has changed on me. And I know deep down inside that uh, the Lord is with me. And I'm very grateful that He's with me because I, I am nothing without the Lord. You me from my old house For it was dark and cold He even stayed there with me When since evil winds would blow One night the walls were closing in he was standing at my door He took me from my whole house I don't live there anymore Now I live in a new house Purchased by the king it poor when that blood was spilled.
built down across a Calvary. I'm blessed and highly favored. I'm cherished and adored. Since he took me from that old house, I don't live there anymore I know what I used to be now I don't mind at all when someone sees me raise my hand or give in an altar call If my whole life come knocking, there's nobody at the door. Cause that was just my whole house. I don't live there anymore. I was in that whole house. Built on sifting sand He gave me a new house Built on nail scarred hands So if my whole life come knocking There's nobody at the door that was just my whole house I don't live there anymore